Okay, welcome everybody. Nice to see, see so many people here. Um, first of all, I would like to remind everybody that there is Drupal contribution going on through, throughout the conference, and tomorrow there's contribution day. And for one, at least the system we're going to talk today about would not be possible without everybody contributing. So it's very important, I, I hope as many as possible will attend and there's there's lots of things to do for all, all, all kinds of skills so everybody's needed. All right. Um, my name is Jari Nausjainen. I'm from Sealy Solutions uh, based in Finland. I, I'm a Drupal Competence Lead at Sealy Solutions and at this project I've worked as a Drupal architect. And Yes, um, hi everyone. Uh, glad to be here with you today. So my name is Evelina Wikström. I work at Neste. I'm going to tell you a bit more about the company in a short while. Uh, I work as a sustainability specialist focusing on our renewable products. And uh, I'm here today presenting this project because I've been acting as a product owner for this product for um, two and a half years now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so um, today we're here uh, with Yari uh, with the presentation Building a Platform for Sustainability. So this is what we have been working on together with Sealy Solutions for one and a half years now. So I'm um, going to present a sort of like a real case study on, 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 the, on our journey and, and the things that we have experienced. I would say that our presentation has um, four different sections. So first um, I'm going to tell you a bit about like what is the product actually. So what is the platform really about. Um, secondly, I'm going to tell a bit more about the needs that we have for the, for the product and why did we end up building such a product. Um, then we're going to tell, or actually Jari is going to tell a bit more about um, the actual development of the product and, and how, how has that sort of like been and how has it evolved over time. And lastly, of course, um, because we already have um, around 20 months of time building the product together, so we're going to share some lessons that we have learned during the project. So, so those four sections will be covered. And also, um, we're aiming to leave some time for questions at the end of the session, so then you're free to ask whatever you have on your mind. So, um, yeah, we hope you enjoyed the session, and, and please do ask in the end if you have anything. So yeah, first um, about Nested, just giving you some background so that you can understand maybe a bit better the solution and what we are what we are doing. So Neste is actually a company that was established in Finland uh, approximately 70 years ago, and the primary purpose of the company was to secure the um, fossil crude oil supply to Finland. So basically, um, making sure that there's enough crude oil in Finland. Um, but the company has evolved quite a lot over time uh, and now recently, during the recent, say, 15 years, renewable products segment has become continuously more and more important for us. So we have been building solutions uh, for our customers that help them to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, primarily our product is uh, renewable diesel uh, for road transport, but we are also continuously developing more solutions. Uh, for instance, uh, renewable jet fuel for planes as well as renewable uh, polymers and chemicals to be used in different industries. And also um, throughout the whole journey, uh, sustainability has been very important for us. So we have actually been selected as the third most sustainable company in the world by uh, Corbett Knights. So it's, a, it's the global 100 listing. And it's also very important to notice the change that and the transformation that has happened in the company. So basically a larger share of our profit already comes from the renewable products when compared to the uh, traditional um, fossil based products. And currently we are very strongly driven by our vision about creating a healthier planet for our children. So really focusing on the renewable segment. Then about the actual products, um, I prepared a couple of slides. Uh, I was thinking how to sort of like um, present the essential about the product that we are building. So um, I'll give it a try. So supplier sustainability portal in a nutshell. When you think about it, um, what is our target as a company? We are targeting becoming a global leader in renewable and circular solutions. Um, and 
what that means, like what kind of drivers are there uh, when we want to aim for this target. So first of all, um, of course we know that we need more raw materials if we want to uh, create more products, different kind of products, but also more products in sort of like quantity wise. So we need to supply more. Um, we also need to manage smaller, more scattered, scattered streams of materials, and this goes down to the type of raw materials that we're using that I'm going to be explaining a bit more shortly. And then, of course, um, because we want to um, source more, we need to sort of like, um, present ourselves as a sort of like a preferred partner, also for our suppliers. So really think about our supplier more as a customer, um, which is maybe a bit against the traditional way of thinking when we are actually the customer. Um, then talking about the sort of like external um, external customer of ours, there's a very diverse pool of different raw material suppliers. I'll be coming back to, back to the characteristics a bit later, but maybe what is important to understand in this context that we have basically um, two categories of supplier raw material suppliers. So. One category is providing this sort of like waste and residue based materials, uh, which could be any sort of like um, processing residues, waste, oils from different industries, even like, for instance, used cooking oil collected from individual restaurants or um, maybe fish fat, waste fish fat from uh, fish processing facility or all kinds of different materials from industries. And then the other basket would be the sort of like cultivated or crop based materials, which are sort of like traditionally cultivated and grown for the purpose of being used, used for the end product. So these could be, for instance, rapeseed oil or uh, soybean oil or, or palm oil, some examples. And currently the split is around like 80% is waste and residue based and 20% is cultivated. And sourcing continuously more waste and residue based materials um, sort of like adds complexity to the uh, buying of the material. Then when we look at the internal customer, we have four different teams working on uh, with, together with the suppliers in ensuring uh, sustainability of the supply. So we have supply team, sustainability, which I am representing. We have compliance team and of course operations team. Then we have two processes. So we have a supplier onboarding process for uh, all our suppliers to become sort of like approved partners of ours. We have very strict sustainability requirements because when we think about the end customer of uh, say renewable diesel, they are buying the product because they want to uh, want to sort of like substitute a fossil product with it. So they want to be sure that it's sustainable. It comes from sustainable regions. And then of course also monitoring individual physical deliveries, batches to be delivered to Neste because we want to make sure that all material that we receive is sustainable. And then lastly, if we think about the benefits that we are seeking after when we want to build a platform for our suppliers for uh, managing these two processes with these stakeholders. So we of course want to harmonize processes, bring in more efficiency that supports growth. Uh, we want to enhance our collaboration and transparency both internally and with the external customer. Um, we also want to develop our sustainability position further, so we want to make sure that our suppliers and materials are sustainable, but also develop it further, help them in that journey. And then we want to store data in a meaningful manner and utilize it in a meaningful manner. Then maybe something still about the journey um, that we have taken for this. So actually when we started, uh, was. It was May in 2017. I had recently joined the company, and we actually uh, held the first sort of like um, open innovation um, session. So this uh, we called it a sustainability hackathon, which was 24 hours in innovating with with external teams that were selected for the hackathon uh, in order to get ideas on uh, how could we di digitalize our supply chain sustainability and what kind of solutions could be used for that. That actually resulted in contracting one of the teams to make a proof of concept version for us, which was late 2017, um, where we actually um, sort of like selected some key functionalities that we wanted to demo, and we were then using this for showing it both internally but also to our external stakeholders quite widely to understand better what should we aim for. Then we actually decided that yes, we need to go for an own platform. Um, telling a bit more also about this later on, but basically wanted to ensure that there's a strong link to our operational business 
um, of course, data, ownership of it, uh, flexibility and control over the platform. Then we actually chose uh, Agile development as a development mode. Um, this was also something quite new for our company and we will be sharing some lessons learned about that as well with Yari. We launched a beta version of the product end of last year, um, which was this minimum viable product that we use as, uh, as, as a sort of like a product that we can test with, our first, with, the, with the first selected suppliers and internal users to understand better and get feedback that is based on actual use of the product. And then this year, target is to launch an improved version, which is like non-beta version anymore. And in the future, we see many interesting aspects, um, such as like looking into prospects, new markets, new type of raw materials, data analytics, uh, more focus on different sustainability aspects, just to give you some examples. Okay, um, well, well, Ness, there was... Uh, doing the planning in the in in the early phases of the project, there was a lot of good work being done. There was user interface mockups done. Uh, they had mapped their processes so that there were process charts. They had done a huge amount of user interviews for uh, kind of uh, to base the design on, and that was the that was the material that was given to us for the proposal, and then. There was quite a lot of information there, and then we went through it and looked at it, and we realized that user interfaces are not enough. We need to design for the user experience too. We need to validate it. We need to test it with users, and uh, because Nestle is a global co global company, they have uh, business in different regions all over the world, and they might there are different processes in different areas. The previous workflow was done quite heavily human-based so that it was essentially a paper process that can be very flexible and, and, and as, as such it can accommodate different kind of processes in different areas. And for a single platform we couldn't do, we couldn't do that and we didn't want to do that because we wanted to be efficient. So there has to, had to be a lot of work to be done to unify the business process all over, all over the different regions. And as we discovered a lot of new work to be done, new needs, new requirements, we had to discuss with, with the Nesta team what's actually the most important when, when we find new stuff, new functionalities to implement or new features or, and other new requirements we need to figure out which is the most important to get first first out and, 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 and what needs to be worked on first. And now Eva talk, talks about more how. Yes, so I um, decided to name this section as landscape complexity and needs because there were various needs from the end users and things um, tend to get quite complicated at some points because of the reasons that Yari also mentioned. So i um, trying to have a bit more look into like what made it, well, it's, it's, it sounds a bit like negative saying what made it so difficult, but maybe that's still what we want to sort of like um, answer to. So basically, um, what challenges the development of such platforms? So listing some key reasons for that. Um, first of all, uh, there's a really big variety in the target group, uh, especially in the external target group, because Neste has the capability to utilize approximately 15 different raw materials um, for the production of renewable products. And these raw materials come with very different characteristics. So um, cultivated versus waste and residue is one dimension, but there are also many other dimensions that we need to take into account. Secondly, um, the sort of um, capabilities of the end users are very different. So um, the companies are very different. So we might talk about a very big global um, multinational company, or then we might talk about a very small uh, waste uh, used cooking oil collector that has three employees. So there's so much variety in, in terms of size, but also geographies we source uh, globally, very globally. And then of course also level of technical skills. So might be that especially in big companies the people are more adva advanced with technologies but in the small companies they might need a lot of support for that. 
Then also, as Jari also mentioned, uh, because our previous system was pretty much pen, paper, and email, um, we noticed that the processes had localized over time, and it took quite an effort to sort of like understand what's going on and how to harmonize, because not everyone is doing the things the same way, and then you need to have the discussion what is the right way of doing things. Then of course, um, we, need, we needed to think a lot about efficiency and how to sort of like make things efficient but without maybe harmonizing too much because then sometimes you also need to think about localization. But of course we know that the demand for um, renewable solutions is on rise, so uh, remaining competitive is very critical for the business. Then also it's good to bear in mind that we are operating in a market that is emerging, so customers uh, have different preferences on sustainability, what makes the product sustainable, and those might uh, change rapidly also, those might depend on the end market as well. And then of course also um, regulatory authorities have different definitions on what is sustainable and those might also change. So new legislation might be implemented, so sometimes we need to react fast uh, on, on, on the sort of like product and the requirements that we have. And lastly, of course, also growth has an impact on uh, what we're doing. So building something and growing uh, fast at the same time requires some uh, extra efforts uh, for balancing things. Uh, one example of this could be, for instance, that now we are sort of like working further to build the 1.0 version of the platform, but at the same time we need to support the growth of the business by implementing, for instance, new raw materials that we want to start buying. So it's a constant balancing to support the growth, but continue developing what you're already doing. And then maybe um, this is one of the questions that I get quite often during the journey, so good to maybe open up a bit. So why didn't you just buy a ready-made solution? This is something we were thinking about and there are some reasons why we did not do that. So um, maybe one of the most evident ones was that we really wanted to have a system that connects to our core business. We always say at Nested that sustainability is at the core of our business with the renewable products and how we operate with them. So we wanted to make sure that we don't just buy a standalone solution that is then forgotten somewhere and maybe someone looks at it once in a month and that's it. But we wanted to make sure it's, it's connected. So that's why um, we have, for instance, the management of physical deliveries um, and we're building integrations to our ERP system. So those are some examples. And then, of course, uh, I already mentioned on the previous slide, the changing uh, market environment. So that's why the flexibility of the end product is, is very important for us. And agile development has supported this highly. Then, of course, um, once you collect data, um, you can do all kinds of things with it. So really, like, um, once you have data in, in a sort of like solid manner, in a, in, in, a, in a structure that makes sense, you can really improve your business, you can improve your understanding, you can optimize what you're doing. And then something that I already mentioned, so as we want to grow, um, there's a limited amount of waste and residue-based raw materials in the, in the world, of course, um, so then we feel that there's a need for the suppliers to position us as the preferred partner. So we want them to feel that they want to work with us. And that was very important for us. So we wanted to think like how could we provide advantages to the supplier actually. Yeah. And I think that Yari will continue from here. Yes. All right. So based on this, these needs, we started to create the solution. And just, just how Evelyn just said that, a ready-made solution was seen as not the not the optimal one for the for the product. So we rather quickly saw that Drupal is a very good match for this, mainly because of because of its uh, capabilities in integrations and customizability. So it can do whatever Neste needs currently, and it very likely can do all the things that they will need in the future. But a bit more about the journey of actual, the actual creation. So we very early saw that uh, this will be and is a, pro a project that is kind of the, it has all the, all the essences of an, of an agile project. I uh, put this Konefin uh, diagram here to remind everybody that, that agile is the way to solve the, the solve the complex issues, where where we know where we want to get, but we are not quite sure, or we cannot plan it ahead, how how we get there. 
and uh, and that is what the SSP product is essentially. It's um, it's a system that has a lot of complexity. It has a lot of needs that are need are found as we go, and uh, but it's still. Uh, very well doable. It's not. It doesn't go into the chaotic realm. It's. It's. It has sound business behind it, and it, it makes sense. So we introduced the client to agile ways of working. They. They had very little experience in agile, previously. So we basically started the project with coaching the team, coaching our team and the nested team, everybody together, so that they can get get working from the very beginning together and um, and there was strong will at Nesta to start working in an agile manner but there was very little experience and there was a very strong tradition of working in waterfall ways of planning first then implementing and then seeing what happened um, but there was a desire to change so we just needed to make that work for us and I can say now that it has been actually very successful. It's been, it's been, it's been enjoyable to work there, and we've had good feedback on the agile ways. And also, we needed to balance our agile ways of working with other projects going on in the company. For example, the ERP project, which is a huge project, of of course, in a for a company that size, and it's definitely nothing to do with agile. And we need to balance with that. And um, okay, then a few words about how we made the team understand what we are actually supposed to achieve. Because um, the business is not something that everybody understands. It has a lot of strange terminology. We were hit with uh, acronyms of, of different sorts for all the all the different feedstocks. There's an acronym, and and the nested people fluently talk about. PFAD and UCO and and all all the things and and then at some point somebody is always saying that well what does this mean? So to make the team able to actually achieve what they needed needed to achieve, we need to not just tell them what they need to do. And of course, because they're skilled Drupal developers, they know how to do it. But it, it was essential that they know why they're doing it. And if somebody hasn't seen Simon, Simon Sinek talk about, talk, talk about the importance of why, it's the, the circle, circle diagram is, is popularized, by, popularized by him. So you should take a look at that. It's a five minute talk. Go and see it. But how we did it. We identified the need that the uh, the team development team needs to know why we're doing this. So I asked Eve, our product owner, to actually just tell. And and it's not important what it says on the on the picture, but important is what what the picture achieves. The the pic picture tells the whole was able to tell the whole team that what is the process for internal customers for the external customers what what kind of different needs, how the, how the paths diverge at different points. Uh, it looks complicated, well, because the process is complicated. And it was, it was kind of down to earth, earth pro approach that we just, you, it's, it's a efficient tool for communication, just draw a picture. And that's what we did. And it was, it was great success. The, the whole team could understand after, after, after looking at this picture and getting the explanation related to it, they could all right away understand that, okay, this is why we're doing it. And now we know what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Of course, more, would, more complexity always comes after it. Okay, so um, the complexity factors, it was already mentioned that business is being done differently in different regions, the feedstocks are different. Uh, um, all kinds of um, conventions are different in different areas, but we don't want to make a solution that that's customized for customized for all all the different use cases. So it needs to be some kind of one size solution that will uh, well enough with fit everybody. And 
And at some, to some point, this was kind of an essential problem in, in, in consolidating ar the architecture, the information architecture, and user experience so that we can actually have a one architectural in, uh, model, one content model where we can have the data in a usable and meaningful way, but mm -hmm. still we can uh, make the user user interface such that it uh, helps all the different users in different different situations. <coughs> and we have learned quite well well in this project that, as it said it said in in Agile, planning is important, but plans are discardable and they will be discarded many times over the project. So one example about how how the plans were discarded. Um, supply chains are one one important thing to model in the in the system because uh, that's what I use to to report the sustainability of the of the supply chain of the suppliers and and also to report the the deliveries that where where they came from and how much uh, carbon emissions were involved in the transportation, for example, and the production of the of the materials. So we have the facilities there and transportation in between. Okay, that was kind of simple, but then we realized that oh, well, the transportation is not something that we can model because we have not enough data for that. We don't know how the how it actually goes between those <coughs> different locations. So, okay, well this. Looks kind of simple, but then the supply chain can it can branch, and it actually can branch in different points, and then eventually there can be can be very many entities <coughs> on different levels, especially in the beginning of the beginning of the chain, and it gets very complex. And for this, actually, the information architecture is not complicated, but the user interface is very complicated. How can we actually make a user interface? to input, let's say, tens or maybe hundreds of entities in a chain that the user will be able to manage manage them. And that's actually, to be honest, that's still something we are not quite finished yet with, but it's, it's a work in progress still. OK, maybe some of you have seen this picture and you know what's coming next. So we made a nice user interface at first. It's Clean, simple, efficient. And then the users come in, and this happens. <laughs> and this is exactly why we need to test. Uh, there are reasons for the users to behave in different ways that we, we are not aware of when we make the first implementation. So we get new design challenges as we go further. And that's agile. Uh, oh, sorry. And we had some ideas from the beginning, and they became invalid at some point. We needed to refactor, we needed to redesign, and we needed to accept that at some point that we have done work, and we have implemented features and functionalities, and they work, but they don't actually do everything that is needed. So we need to iterate and go to, we need to step a few, few steps, steps back to get actually forward. And uh, an important part of that was to challenge the previous plans so that we can actually see before we do the final implementations for something that, well, we planned this three months ago like this, but maybe we shouldn't do it like this. Maybe we need to think over it a bit more. And we need to do that, uh, we also needed to push the business stakeholders to to think deeper into their into their area, not just give the first answer that based on their own knowledge or their own expertise, but also ask with their colleagues to get all the different information so that if if somebody who knows the European business and the Asian business answers the question and then we implement something and then the American specialist comes in and says that well we can't use this because it doesn't answer our needs. Because the processes are different. So everybody needs to be heard and we need to make sure that the business requirements are brought in from all the different areas. And most important, we need to know what are the cats like, which cat wants to eat from which bowl, so we need to understand the users. So essentially, many people who have come, to, come into the project since the start 
have told me that, hey, well, you're not using Drupal that much out here. But actually, we are very, we're, we are actually very deep in Drupal. We are using custom entities, which is an awesome feature for us. We have, I think, two nodes on the whole system currently. But custom entities, we have plenty. Because th there's different needs we need. <coughs> and the custom entities work very, very well with workflows, which is in Drupal core. That's excellent. We've used messages module for creating notifications and, and kind of notifying and enabling communication between users for different events. Queuing events, something happening when something else happens. And it needs to happen in a batch because we don't want to them happen in line and, and everything co goes kind of uh, asynchronously. And then we've uh, recently started using heavily the REST API and developing React components on top of that. And then, of course, one very nice feature that we have uh, gotten from Drupal, and it's definitely an advantage, it's the security features, the security practice in Drupal, uh, access management, that, that kind of things. And then managing users, user roles are you know, an important, important uh, role. So essentially, we are, we are using Drupal as the back, as the core of our backend, and we're extending it. And, uh, it's it's something that I was thinking of yesterday when Chris was talking about uh, about Drupal expanding the horizons and going into integrations and expanding things. This, this is actually just what we've been doing here. So next, what have we learned? Eva, you will start with that. Yes. Um, so some lessons learned. Trying to be pretty brief here looking at the time. Um, so maybe um, something that we noticed is that actually experience from working with agile methods is not as important as commitment from the organization to do so. So as Yari mentioned, we are pretty much a waterfall um, house. So we've been doing some agile development on our retail side, but not really on the on the production and product side at all. So this project was actually a pioneer at Neste in, in working in an agile manner. So. Um, this has been, of course, been really encouraging because we have been uh, we have received a lot of support, for instance, from the from the management, and it has been really clear that this is pro they want this project to be agile. So there's this kind of support. But then maybe what is the challenge is that the, although you are agile in your own bubble, but if the organization around you is is acting as waterfall and the expectations are as in waterfall projects, uh, there are clashes for sure. So something that we have notice for instance that there is still a strong appetite in the company for upfront planning um, deadlines so we want to know what is coming what is your half uh, half year plan for next half year uh, when are you gonna deliver this when are you gonna deliver that what is your deadline so there's a strong strong will to have that and that's sort of like conflicts with the agile way of working so we sort of need to balance constantly with the expectations that we have Secondly, um, something we noticed that the stakeholders don't always know first what they want. So um, we noticed quite quickly that because our previous system was pen and paper and email, um, the stakeholders can't really describe what they want from a system. How do they want to do things in a system? It's very difficult for them. So we had to move into prototyping and creating mock-ups quite quickly and showing them to the end users because when they were able to use those, they could sort of like elaborate their comments much more efficiently. And we, we have been doing a lot of validation and also what is important, what Yari pointed out, that we do, do it in different regions so our key regions where we operate to understand the differences between the different regions. So I think this has been very important for us, but maybe one finding also is that our, when I was talking that our organization is not used to this way of working, it can also be seen with the prototypes. So for instance, our internal stakeholders don't even know how to use prototypes. How are they going to click through a prototype? So we need to even teach them to do that. So really starting from the scratch. And this is just an example on like how can we gradually improve. So this is the landing page from our system for suppliers. And you can see that it has evolved over time. And the only way to allow this kind of uh, evolvement is to be brave enough to show work in progress 
to your end customer. So not waiting for two years to make it perfect because you simply can't make it perfect without showing it to your end customer and getting the feedback from them. What do they appreciate, what they don't like. So here are some like concrete, uh, sort of like uh, concrete things that we have done for the landing page that all are based on feedback from the users. And then maybe just the last point from me is that sort of like um, Neste is traditionally a company that is sort of like industri heavily industrial background focused on the production of products. So that's really sort of our, our area, our competence area. So everything comes down pretty easily to efficiency. How can we be efficient? How can we streamline our processes? How can we produce more and uh, with less resource and these kind of things. So we have really had to challenge how the way we think and really start to think about the customer, the human there, and start to think about the supplier as our customer and not vice versa. So really sort of like challenging the way we think, uh, being more human centric. So that's sort of like the middle middle section here. And that's sort of like something that we need to do if we want to at some point think more like um, more from a value based perspective, thinking about having this sort of like platform and ecosystem type of thinking. So this is the journey that we are at. Yes, handing back to Jarek. Yes, um, very important success factor was to to have uh, everybody involved and everybody feeling that they are a member of the team. So we don't have a we don't have a development team and 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 the client team separately. We don't have a client a vendor uh, distinction basically there. Uh, from the very beginning, beginning, everybody has been part of the same team, doing their different, driving their different roles, bringing in their own expertise. So, effectively, what effectively what we get from including everybody as as kind of equal member of the team, they have everybody has different kind of um, understanding and knowledge, expertise. They bring that in, and we can we can utilize that. So so we don't actually have to stop working and wait to reach for somebody who knows one detail because they are already there, they are part of the team and we, we know them and we, we are familiar with working with everybody. Um, one thing uh, is that the team has grown quite large in the process and what easily happens in a large team is that you have somebody, somebody who's, who's responsible for back-end and others who are responsible for front-end and, and then maybe somebody drives one functionality and others some other functionalities and it's been very important to remind us all, all the time that we don't want to, to silo the development so that, so that even if somebody knows, knows one feature better than others they shouldn't be kind of they shouldn't own it completely so that, uh, so that the, the work kind of scatters around people, but the team should keep united, and that's uh, that's really something that we have had to remind of us, uh, remind ourselves every two weeks in our retros. Basically, always somebody points out that hey, let's not silo the work, and let's still not silo the work. And so far, it's it's going fine. And then, of course, important part of uh, making a team work is to co-locate the team so that when, when the team members are there they might be might be sitting next to each other or on the other side of the room they can ask questions they they can they can get the answers they need very quickly and uh, and also it's important to have a kind of sense of community and have fun with the people have have lunches together and uh, that that all works towards dis making making the distinction between client and vendor disappear so that everybody's just on the team and everybody's member of the team. And that's I think that's maybe one of the most important points on, on this slide. And then lastly but not least uh, I want to emphasize that design is facilitation. Design is uh, something that is not only done by designers. It's done by everybody it's it's uh, we can think of user interface design we can think of concept design user experience design technical design but still it's a cooperation and and what it needs to do is to get the relevant information about what and why we need to do 
out of the people who who actually know the business for which it needs uh, uh, for so that we can actually fulfill the needs of the business and um, it is essentially a process of discovery we we find new things and and we need to dig deeper get more information and that needs to be done together okay so any questions we have a few minutes left. Please use the microphone. Uh, you, make, you mentioned a complete team, with, including some people from the organization. Can you give a rough what, what kind of people were in the team, developers, front ends, back end? Just out of curiosity. Yes, um, we had um, we had the, from from the Nesta side, we had the product owner and the three specialists. Four. Four. Four specialists and, uh, and a project manager from your side too. And then from, from our side, there was, a, there was a project manager as a kind of a business contact. Then we have myself as the, as the tech lead or architect. And then we have a scrum master, front end developers, uh, UX developers, uh, UX designers, uh, and Drupal developers, uh, integration specialist. And did we have still some other people? And then we have test automation people separately. And content specialist. And content specialist nowadays also. And also a testing manager for the user <laughs> acceptance testing. And probably still somebody who we forget. It's, <laughs> it's, it's close to 20 or over 20 people nowadays, yes. I think, yep. involved in the project. And you said you co-located them. So was it a, uh, a team that was uh, actually together all, all the time for two weeks or just uh, on a regular basis, two days a week or something? Yes, we, uh, we, have, um, we have an office space provided by Neste and we work there, I'd say, two or three, three days a week in, in one, one space. And most people are, are there and we have kind of tried to make so that there's at least one day when everybody's there. Okay. Yes, please. Interesting presentation, thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on, on the working with the Drupal APIs and uh, React front end, since I saw it on one of the slides. Mm. Well, it's a, it's a large area we can talk further later, but I'll just give a quick overview. So um, basically we, have, we had two options. We could use JSON API or then do custom REST REST resource plugins, and we ended up with custom REST resource plugins because we had quite strict security concerns, and JSON API was not out of the box able to fulfill all the exact needs that we had, and and we decided that oh well, if we need to customize, then we're just going to go with full custom solution for the REST endpoints, and then. Uh, if you happen to see Fabian Franz's uh, presentation yesterday about decoupling the back end, we've actually been doing something similar to that so that we are actually uh, pushing the data for the front end from, from the back end before going through, through the render pipelines and, and using Drupal settings for relaying information for, for the React applications. Any other questions? Go ahead. What is the size of the project in terms of custom code? Um, if we count all the PHP, React code, uh, SAS code, and maybe even even configuration YAMLs, we probably get something like one hundred thousand lines today. And it's growing rapidly. Anything more? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.